Shirley Williams, you came from a rather extraordinary background, some might say. Your mother, an acclaimed writer, your father, a political scientist. What was your childhood like? Oh, wonderful. Um, partly, one of the reasons for that was that my father was, without any question, delighted to have a daughter. And he always brought me up to think, you can do anything. We're talking, after all, about the 1930s. This wasn't a common attitude by uh, fathers. I mean, mothers were, loved their children and was expected to. But most fathers in the 30s were rather disappointed to have a daughter. The second thing was that my, I always understood and never resented the fact that my mother, as a writer, would firmly shut herself away at 9.30 in the morning and reappear at sort of 5.30 in the afternoon, having spent the whole time in between working like mad on writing. I kind of understood and knew that she had to do that. This was when she was working. It was after Testament of Youth, but it was part of her life uh, business. So again, in my household, nobody thought it was odd that a woman should be professional. Nobody thought it was odd that she should spend a lot of her time working. Did your mother encourage you or inspire you to go into politics? When I was very little, I wanted to be an opera singer, but that lasted about five years. And then very early on, I wanted to go into politics. I remember thinking it was the obvious thing I wanted to be. And by the time I was 15, I was pressing to join the Labour Party as a member. She won a scholarship to Oxford, and there she set her heart on politics. At 24, she stood for the port of Harwich. In spite of the nautical smack of her publicity handout, she didn't succeed the first time or the second, or the third. It took 10 years to win a seat and enter the male preserve of politics. What was it actually like trying to get a seat at that time as a young woman? Well, I, I had two strikes against me. One was being a woman, the other was being a Roman Catholic, and it was awful, awful hard to discover which was the main reason why it was hard to get a seat. But um, I, I don't get angry very easily, and I think what made me more angry more often was the, the actual sort of personal clear lack of interest in anything I had to say or anything other women had to say. When you did enter government, you became ed Education Secretary in 1976 and closed many grammar schools, introduced comprehensive school system. Some people think you wrecked the school system. They always say that still. They do. Some of them still say that and yes. want the reintroduction of grammar schools. Do you think that's too harsh a judgment? Do you still stand by your decisions Absolutely. over education? Only about 15% of the whole uh, cohort of young people ever got to grammar schools. The change, the, the number who, got, who went to grammar school after having um, been rejected at the 11 plus, the system of selection, were frightfully few, less than 2%. Most secondary modern schools, almost all, had no sixth form. Effectively, they hit a brick ceiling by the time they were 14, and it was almost impossible to get beyond it. So what we did as a country was for years and years to effectively condemn three quarters of our children to having no real prospects of the kinds of skills that we need today. Let's return to your time as a member of the Cabinet. Did you at that stage think you could ever become Prime Minister? Yes, I thought I could because people told me I could. But I think I probably never believed that I was able enough to be the Prime Minister. I didn't have that kind of complete conviction in myself that, for example, Mrs Thatcher had. But there was another factor too, which I think I should be honest about. Um, I think Mrs Thatcher would never have been Prime Minister. She and I went to the same college and all the rest of it. Unless she had had what she did have, which was a totally supportive spouse. Did you not have that? No, I didn't. First of all, um, my husband fell in love with somebody else by the time we'd been married for about 13 years when I was ploughing my way up the political front and he was ploughing his way up the academic one. But by the time it became, the, the sort of key decisions had to be made, which were 19, I suppose 1970 and again 1974, uh, effectively he had gone by 1970. Um, I understood why, though I, I did love him a lot, but it, it probably wasn't ever going to be a, the right person for a would-be woman politician to, to marry. For all those reasons, I didn't have the supreme confidence in myself that uh, I think undoubtedly Mrs Thatcher had. By the late 1970s, politically Labour was in quite a lot of trouble. It certainly um, was. After a decade, really, of strife in the country. Had you, by that stage, made up your mind that the Labour Party was not going to be your future political home? 
not only me, but also, of course, my, my colleagues, particularly uh, Bill Rogers and uh, David Owen, were all pushed over the edge by the same thing. And that was that we had, um, we had all been heavily involved in the 1975 referendum. We had been on whether we should stay in Europe. Exactly five years later, four years later, the Labour Party, after losing the 79 election, then at the executive level, the party level, came out with a commitment to uh, reconsider staying as members of the European Union. We found that so irresponsible and so ludicrous that we couldn't support it. How did it actually happen, practically? The Gang of Four, the setting up of the SDP? It was great fun. We, 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 we didn't really, we knew it was a big gamble because it, Britain's not a country which is, at that time was inclined in the least to accepting third, fourth, fifth parties. Tory Labour is what the country was. All the figures bear that out. I mean, at that time, three quarters of the electorate voted either for Labour or the Conservatives. We wanted a different sort of party. We also wanted to end the class conflict thing. But we felt that the only way we could do that, being true to our own principles, which were social democratic principles, was by starting a new party. What do you think is going to happen to the Liberal Democrats in the election? Do you think they'll be wiped out, as some no, of the doom-mongers are predicting, or do you think they'll be in another coalition? I think we're bound to be the main factor in another coalition. I don't know which way it will go. I'm not, it won't be for me to say, and it'll be for my leaders of my, this generation to decide. But I'm absolutely certain we will not be wiped out. It's not a, not a chance in hell that we'll be wiped out. Personality-wise, you've been described as a very nice person, sometimes a bit indecisive. Do you think you weren't ruthless enough to make it to the top as well as the reasons you gave in terms of having support at home? I reject the indecisive bit um, because I really think that both in terms of the SDP and in terms of Europe I could hardly be so described. These aren't exactly popular policies to be associated with all one's political life. Um, what I think is fair is that I probably wasn't ruthless enough, probably wanted to be liked too much. So perhaps I'm too tolerant of other parties. Um, but I think that's the way it should be. And I like, the, I like to think about um, the idea of consensus rather than the idea of endless confrontation. I think British politics is frankly too adversarial. And I think in being too adversarial, it leaves behind a great many of the electors.